Welcome to the White Spring Bunker. These halls were built to safeguard some of the most prestigious members of the United States government. Now we are all that remains. Though we are always looking for men and women capable of restoring what has been lost. In return, we offer this, our refuge from the world above. Please, take your time and look around. Our assets have made great efforts to restore this place to its former glory. Welcome, member, to our little enclave. Greetings, members. As always, I am The Operative, your designated tour guide and host here at the White Spring. Throughout the years, the history of Monaga has been one of hopes and tragedies. A curse seemed to linger over the town and the mines which sustained the residents, one which seemed to envelop the whole area after the Great War. Earl Williams had never forgotten the promise of wealth, nor his desire to return home to Monaga someday. After convincing a group of like-minded members of Foundation, Earl would lead them into the depths of the mine in search of their fortune, and instead, they would find themselves the victims of horrifying experimentation. Keem Cryptid follows in Earl's footsteps, and soon discovers that there are some secrets that should stay buried. This is bullshit, Earl. There ain't nothing down here. If we came all the way from Foundation for a heap and help in a dirt, you're gonna owe us big time. Settle down. I told y'all this trip would be worth it, and it will be. This here mine's been closed up for years. Untouched. Those auto miners missed plenty when they tried to clear this place out before the war. Once we get into the main shaft, it'll all be ours for the taking. Gold of plenty, I'm telling you. You better be right, Earl, because my wife is going to kill me if not. Damn straight I'm right. You assholes have been bitching and moaning since we left. Monunga was my home before those fucking scorch ran us off, and I know this mine is the mother load. Feel free to run off with your tails between your legs, but I'm getting what's mine. For me, and for Maggie. There was a collective grumbling from the crew, but they had come this far already. Earl watched as they collected rope in their packs, preparing to make the descent into the very bowels of the mine, where Earl Williams was convinced that the true treasure of Monongo could be found. What had started as the germ of an idea over too many drinks had turned into a near obsession for Earl. Before the war, he had been a miner, scrapping by trying to put food on his family's table, working long hours underground. He had tried to warn the townsfolk when the Hornwright executives made their offer to buy out the mine and pay dividends back to everyone. Those initial payments appeared to be a godsend, a lifeline that soon turned into a boat anchor wrapped around their collective legs. The auto miners had come in and stripped the mines of everything of value, or so they said, leaving nothing but dust and dirt in their wake. Fucking Hornwrights ruined everything. Earl had been on the bandwagon to march right down to the Hornwright's mansion and burn the whole place to the ground. But the bombs had put an end to that idea. After that, he'd done his best to protect his family, first from the goddamn raiders that infested the hills, then the monsters that bubbled up from the south. Once Earl got a load of the scorched and the flying monsters people called scorch beasts, he packed up his family and as many folks as would follow, and headed north, not stopping until he left Appalachia far behind. Earl had always kept part of his heart back in Appalachia, so when his family finally hooked up with settlers who said they were heading back, Earl went along with them. The region wasn't anything like he remembered. Everyone left behind had died or worse, but Earl still tried to make the best of it. He and his daughter set up at Foundation, but Monanga kept calling him back. He still didn't believe the mines were empty. He figured those auto miners got all the easy ore, but may have opened up some new veins further down a treasure trove of materials just waiting for someone brave enough to get it. Nothing worth it is ever easy, right? So he'd start talking about his plans, collecting like-minded individuals who shared his desire to strike it rich and start a better life. Of course, his daughter Maggie thought he was crazy, loved him to death, 
but never understood why he was so obsessed with going back to Mananga. They'd all heard the stories. The town was cursed and some such nonsense. But that just made Earl all the more anxious to go. As long as people stayed away, it meant whatever was in those mines was untouched and ripe for the taking. Traveling north through the Divide hadn't been easy, but at least they didn't have to deal with the raiders of old. Getting to Mananga hadn't been the problem. Keeping his crew together had been. <laughs> Scared of a bunch of old stories. Pussies. The town was a bit worse for wear, having been abandoned for well over a decade. The old church had been burned to the ground and several houses had been crushed by landslides, but to Earl it was still home. They spent the first couple of days camped in the town proper, collecting supplies and checking the old paths up to the mountain to the mines. The whole area was deathly quiet. No people, no animals. Just the sound of the wind whistling down from above. It had spooked the crew and Earl spent most of his time talking up the scrap and ore they were going to find up in the mine. They'd be rich, or at least well off enough to strike out on their own. The whole time, Earl kept writing in his journal. An old habit of his, he figured it would serve as a reminder of his adventures down the road. He left pages at the campsite, then up at the old tunnel entrance. The way had been blocked, but Earl and his crew had dug their way through. And after another pep talk, they all entered the mine, heading ever downward into the earth. <sighs> Feels like we were only here yesterday. Earl had set up their final camp just above the main shaft. Back in the old days, the cavern was the staging area for miners, a place to eat, rest, and prepare before heading back down for their shift. It had also been where Hornwright had set up their auto miners. A few of them had been left behind, and Earl took pride in taking a sledgehammer and giving the bots a few good whacks. Feeling a bit better about everything, Earl scribbled a few last notes before stuffing the journal back into his knapsack and placing it into one of the work trailers. Taking one last look up the tunnel, he turned back to his crew. All right, now let's get what we came for. Eddie, you and Bob wait up here until we give you the all clear. Everyone else, let's get to work. The group walked over and grabbed the thick ropes, looping them around their waists, while Bob and Eddie checked that they were securely fastened to pieces of heavy equipment. On Earl's signal, they all slowly dropped down the main shaft into the darkness, their lights quickly lost in the gloom. Shit show. Is that all of them grade 34? Well, yeah, these plus the two above. Wonderful. How did they get past the perimeter sensors? Well, it looks like they tunneled right through the main entrance. <laughs> we were lucky they tripped the secondary alarm. Those geniuses in security didn't bother to think about that one, did they? Great. I've already notified Beta Team. The boss man is on his way. Oh, I just can't wait. Stow that shit, 34. Unless you want to go back on pacification duty. <sighs> Sorry, sir. Uh, should we close up the entrance again? Not yet. This place ain't the most stable, and detonating explosives probably not the best idea. We can place additional sensors if needed. Yes, sir. Gray 5 watched Gray 34 walk back towards where they had two dozen men and women tied up on the floor of the cavern. Cursing under his breath, Gray 5 couldn't imagine why these people had decided to tunnel into an abandoned mine, especially this one in particular. His comm channel beeped, which meant that Beta Lead had arrived. Step 2. Team, the boss is here. The Grays all stopped and stood at attention as a group of people, all wearing lab coats, entered through a concealed side entrance and walked to the center of the cavern. At one time, this had been the hub of the Monongah Mine Complex. A large platform occupied the middle of the space, with various rock-crushing equipment scattered about. Side tunnels branched off in every direction, leading to the other mine shafts that honeycombed their way through the entire mountain. After the first mole miner rebellion, renegade mole miners had set up a small settlement in the mine, only to be discovered by the packed pacification squads and quickly eliminated. Due to its isolated location and reputation for keeping away the curious, Beta Team had set up one of their experimental laboratories in the space, testing mutagenic compounds on likely candidates and observing the results. Then we get to clean up the messes. 
Beta had designated the Monanga facility as their primary location for their Wendigo project, a particularly vicious mutation present in the wasteland. The Wendigos, as they were known by the locals, were related to ghouls, only smarter, faster, and incredibly more dangerous. It had been Arctos Pharma which had first replicated the unique genetic mutation just before the war, isolated from a wild sample captured by one of their hunter squads. How that individual had contracted the mutation was unknown, and several deaths were documented during the tracking and capture process, but it had been well worth the results, at least in the opinion of the Arctos scientists. In the intervening years, the Arctos researchers, now redesignated as Beta Team by the Pact, refined their mutagenic serums, using varying doses of radiation to create different species of Wendigo. One particularly promising early sample escaped confinement and soon became known as the Night Stalker, terrorizing the Sons of Dane in the Northern Savage Divide. The Greys never liked Beta's research. Despite benefiting themselves from the mutagenic serums, the creatures Beta experimented on were unpredictable and extremely dangerous. Whatever control they claimed to have over the creatures was never enough to prevent multiple containment breaches and escapes, resulting in many wounded and dead. However, the Council deemed the results satisfactory enough to continue to support further research, despite what Grey Five considered to be abject failure. But what do I know? I'm just a grunt. Grey Five recognized Beta Lead as he walked up, assistance in tow, with a scowl on his face. The Grey Operative braced for the explosion. How incredibly disappointing, Gray Five. Sir, we reacted as soon as we received the alarm. And yet these individuals almost stumbled upon our research facility. Not our fault, sir. We were told the mine entrance was completely impassable. In fact, it was your survey team that passed along that information to us. Irrelevant, Gray Five. I am holding your team responsible for this incident, and I will inform the council. Of course, sir. Now, what exactly do we have here? Scavengers by the look of it. There were twenty when we arrived, eighteen on the cavern floor, and two more in the shaft above. We were able to surprise them. However, two of them returned fire, forcing us to kill them. That is also unfortunate. However, this could be an opportunity. An opportunity? We've been working on a new project. Codename is Leviathan. However, we haven't been able to procure adequate samples. Dr. Blackburn has been monopolizing resources for his super mutant monstrosities. Sir, are you sure? We haven't run suitability tests yet. Beggars cannot be choosers. And Leviathan does not require perfection. It requires bodies. Whatever you say, Doctor. All right, team. You heard Beta. Let's get these subjects over to processing before anyone wakes up. And please mind the merchandise. I do need them to be in one piece. At least for now. Gray Five saluted and watched as Beta Lead and his assistants walked over to the sedated scavengers, leaning down and taking notes as they went. Gray Five waited until they were finished, then signaled his team to start collecting the new subjects. At least we don't have to take them very far. Let's get this done double time! One by one, Earl Williams' scavenger crew were loaded onto carts and wheeled across the cavern through another set of concealed metal doors. Several technicians were there to greet them, making notations in the nearby terminal before putting each subject into their own cell. Gray Five finished up and watched as the first of the scavengers started to wake up. He almost pitied them. Almost. Whatever Beta had planned wasn't going to be pretty. It was going to be painful, and Gray Five just hoped it wouldn't become yet another mess that he needed to clean up. Project Leviathan Log A412, Dr. Jeffrey Cardoza, Lead Researcher. 
We finally received approval from the director to begin testing the new enhanced mutagenic compounds. Unfortunately, I was unable to convince her to provide any additional test subjects, owing to the demands of Project Oni. Damn that Blackbird. Our contributions to the cause are just as important as his. It's not our fault the Deltas weren't entirely successful, and the Greys wouldn't even exist without our serum breakthroughs. He can't even see past his own ego when I corrected him on the pronunciation of Oni. I mean, if you're going to name a project after a mythological creature, you can at least get the name right. <clears throat> Let's get back on track. It was a stroke of luck that those scavengers happened to stumble into our lair. The initial battery of tests identified several potential candidates for Leviathan, while the others will be subjected to the standard experimental process, hopefully with more success at controlling their behavior this time. It is our hope that this newest protocol will not only increase the ferocity of the Wendigos, but also increase our measure of control of them. Though even I must admit the idea of total control of these experiments, is probably beyond our current capabilities. Once the protocol is finished, we will monitor their activities within the mine, which should allow for further refinements to our process. But Leviathan is far more important. I've seen Blackburn's specifications for the O9 Plus variants. Even I admire their terrifying stature, but the potential of Leviathan cannot be overstated. If our projections are correct, it will tower above any creature we've cataloged or created. Can't you see I'm in the middle of something? Sorry, Doctor, but you wanted to be informed when the Leviathan subject regained consciousness. Of course, of course. Is he coherent? For the moment, the mutagenic process is occurring faster than we anticipated. That is a good sign. I'd like to speak with him, while I still can. Yes, Doctor, but I would recommend beginning the extraction protocol. He might not be so easy to move once the process begins to move into its later stages. I suppose you're right. I would like the opportunity for more hands-on examinations before that happens. Within reason, of course. Whatever you say, Doctor, but remember what happened last time? That's why the revised protocols are in place. Now, let's get down to the lab. The technician cursed under her breath. It was just her luck to have been reassigned to this godforsaken hellhole of an old mine. You said he was coherent. That's one of the other subjects. We couldn't get close enough to administer the sedatives. He's undergoing the Wendigo process fully conscious. That should be very interesting. Too bad we can't interview them to get their impressions of the change. <laughs> yeah, a real shame. The technician led Dr. Cardoza down the rough-cut hallway, leading down to the main laboratory. Partially cut out of the rock, while the rest made use of the original mine shaft, the Monaga facility was the second largest laboratory supporting Beta Team's research. The primary was located deep underneath the old Arctos Farmer building to the south, where the likes of the Sheep Squatch had been created years before. Reaching the end of the corridor, the two exited into the common space, where the specimens were housed until they were transferred into the main cavern for observation. A series of plexiglass cells lined both sides of the laboratory. Each one displayed long gouge marks along the inner surfaces, a testament to the ferocity of the previous occupants. Where is Leviathan? Cell R45. We didn't want to take any chances. Very good. That will make transport much easier. The technician forced a smile. She'd been part of several transport operations in the recent past, and none of them could be considered easy. The best they could do was to restrain the subject and hope they didn't catch you with a stray swipe. Researcher Tolliver was still in medical, recuperating after one of the experiments got an arm loose and tore open her abdomen before they could restrain it again. Passing the cells, the technician couldn't help but look. Each one contained one of the scavengers they'd collected, and each one of them was in various states of transformation. Some had already lost their hair, and the skin had taken on a glowing sheen as it slowly blackened. The arms and feet extended, becoming claw-like in their appearance. Since most were sedated, the pop and creak of bones readjusting themselves could be heard, along with the soft groans, except for cell T23. The occupant, once a vibrant young man, 
was now in the throes of transformation, screaming as his body changed, bones and muscles pulling themselves apart and knitting back together again. Quite fascinating, isn't it? Fascinating? How can you look at that and not gaze in the wonder of what we've been able to create? The human genome is so much putty in our hands to shape as we wish. While we may be making monsters today, I envision us being able to finally perfect humanity tomorrow. Whatever you say, Doctor. It's something, at least. The test subject threw itself at the glass, rebounding, then doing it over and over, until it finally doubled over and fell to the floor of the cell. Ah, this must be the final throes of the process. Just look at the elongation of the fingers and toes. The muscle mass has almost been entirely relocated to the extremities, leaving the torso nearly desiccated. Make sure we have recordings of the entire transformation. I'd like to do a further analysis. I'll have that delivered to your office. Good, good. Now, let's see how our guest of honor is progressing. The two of them walked past more cells. The technician tried to keep her eyes straight ahead. Even as the good doctor paused to look at each of their test subjects, a smug smile plastered across his face. They arrived at a large cell, reinforced with steel bars. Several of them showed signs of recent repair, a result of their last failed experiment with Leviathan. Ah, Dr. Cardoza, I have good news. The subject appears to be stable. That is good news. He is conscious, though the transformation will render him unable to vocalize very soon. No time to waste. I'd like to speak with him. Of course, Dr. Cardoza. Approaching the large cell, they could hear the sounds of crying coming from within. (laughs) I do hate when they get emotional. One advantage of keeping them sedated through the process, unless absolutely necessary. However, we must document Leviathan as thoroughly as possible. The technicians rolled their eyes. As far as they were concerned, Leviathan was a pipe dream. The number of failed experiments tied to the project were almost too numerous to count. With the ever-increasing population of Wendigos the only demonstrable result of their work at Mononga, but far be it from them to complain, it was far better to keep the powers that be satisfied than to end up on one of the slabs as the next test subject. (laughs) Inside the cell, the man lay writhing on the table, his arms and legs held down by large straps. Already the effects of the mutagen serum could be seen. Large growths were visible on either side of his head, while the legs were showing signs of deformation and elongation. So far, the results were interesting, though the other subjects had progressed even further before their bodies gave out. Oh, oh God. It hurts so bad. What did you do to me? Where's my crew? Ah. Mr. Williams, you are Earl Williams, correct? (laughs) Maggie, Maggie, I need to get back to Maggie. He's been repeating that name for a few hours now. We believe it may be his wife or daughter. Okay, Mr. Williams, we just need to finish our tests and you can return to this Maggie person. But first, I need you to describe to us... How you are feeling. Let it go. Please. The bar's all over. Let it all fall. Oh, what did you do to me? I just want to go home. Focus, Mr. Williams. This next part is very important if you want to go home. <laughs> it feels wrong. <laughs> Good, good. You're doing very well, Mr. Williams. None of our other subjects stayed conscious or coherent this long. I think you'll do nicely. Oh my god. Would you look at that? Is that another head? Uh, yes. Sorry. 
A most intriguing development. Mr. Williams is quite the specimen. I believe I've seen everything I need to see. Monitor his progress, and if he exceeds existing containment protocols, you must move him to the upper chamber. Are we clear? I... I mean... Look at him! Pull yourself together, man. This is nothing more than a continuation of our experiments. If you're not capable of following my orders, I'll find someone who will, and you will no longer be useful to us. Do you understand? Yes, Dr. Cardoza. I'm sorry. It's just... Amazing, isn't it? Leviathan will succeed, and we will finally have something to show to the Council that isn't one of Blackburn's FEV pets. Um, can we get some extra security for the transfer? He appears to be getting bigger. This is nothing we haven't handled before. Just get it done. I'm due back at the Arctos facility to check on our next Sheep Squatch experiment. I expect an update as soon as Mr. Williams has been moved. Yes, Doctor. Dr. Cardoza took one last look at Earl Williams. The results were so much better than he expected. Even though even he was a bit unsettled when he saw it now had three pairs of eyes staring back at him. And a scream emanated from multiple mouths, vibrating the glass of the cell, and spraying an acidic vomit into the air. This will do nicely, very nicely indeed. Once upon a time, 27 years after the bombs fell, there were two people, a vault dweller and a California girl. They met and sparks flew. That's when things got interesting. Once Upon a Wasteland is their story. Follow Elizabeth Kirby and Odessa Valdez as they pursue their happily ever after in the post-apocalyptic Appalachian wasteland of Fallout 76. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and many other podcasting platforms. Once Upon a Wasteland, a Fallout 76 love story. Available now. Project Leviathan Log A418, Dr. Jeffrey Cardoza, Lead Researcher. Despite a few minor mishaps, the subject formerly known as Earl Williams was transferred to our holding area just below the main mine shaft. Perhaps I could have requested additional security, but no need to cry over spilt milk now. I never liked those technicians anyway. There was some damage done to the laboratory, and there was a containment breach amongst the enhanced Wendigo subjects, and regrettably several had to be terminated before order was restored. On-site monitoring will no longer be possible, and I've requested that all intact inventory be transferred here. A significant side effect of the transformation process was noted during the transfer, and was likely the cause of the mishaps. Leviathan's vocalizations appear to cause a very localized fear response. Subsonics, perhaps? Triggering deep neural coding? Personnel in the immediate area seem to be gripped with overwhelming panic. Wendigos appear to be immune to this effect, however, making it both an offensive and defensive weapon. Let's see Blackburn come up with anything as interesting as that. Leviathan will remain at Mononga until such a time as I can arrange for an alternative containment site. The next steps will focus on weaponization. If I can show the director the power of our creations, she is sure to increase our allocation of resources. There's no reason we can't be considered a viable alternative to Project Onai. Personal note, I spoke with Dr. Trillian yesterday. 
Her loyalty to Blackburn aside, and the fact that she's also unwilling to change the name of Project Onai to Project Oni, she appears to be receptive to my advances. Fraternization among the teams is not unheard of, but I will still proceed carefully in my courting of her. Perhaps I should ask her to attend the showing of Last Stand at Fort McGee. I've been told she does like Western filmography. While Dr. Cardoza considered his options for wooing Dr. Trillian, the view screen behind him showed a panoramic view of the interior of the Monongah Mine. The infrared cameras mounted high on the ceiling kept track of the groups of Wendigos as they scavenged for food in the darkness. The heat signature of the creatures suddenly scattered as something else came into view. The huge figure towered above the much smaller Wendigos and seemingly paused to stare at the camera above. Six eyes glowed in the darkness, blinking once, twice. <laughs> Leviathan rises. Team Cryptid was fighting gallantly, with Thomas and Skinner leading the way as the humans had run for cover against the horde of Wendigos. Then there was the enormous creature who stalked after them on legs nearly 20 feet tall, capped with three huge heads, each one filled with sharp teeth and spitting poison. In the darkness of the cave, lit only by the muzzle flashes of the team and their flashlights, the huge creature's screams had caused panic amongst the members, scattering many of them in all directions making them easier pickings for the small creatures. Get the cover! Keep firing! Phillips, behind you! They're coming out of the goddamn walls! There's too many of them! That thing is coming back! Get behind me! Douglas, I think I found something! A little busy here, Emily! It's a door! Maybe a way out. A door? Definitely a door! Get over here and see if we can get it open. Ah! Shit! That thing just crushed Phillips. Stay clear of the legs. Hold him off. We need to get out of here. Skinner, we found a door. A door? Thomas, we might have an exit. About time. Team, cover cryptid. On me. It's Jam. Emily. Grab that pickaxe! Watch out! Damn, that was close! Thanks, Skinner! Thank me if we live. Just get that door open! But we don't know where it goes. Anywhere is better than here! Agreed! Whatever you're doing, you better make it quick! Uh, it's stuck! Here, pull harder! Come on! Pull, damn it! I'm pulling, I'm pulling! Keep going! It's opening! It's damn dark in there! Emily, get in there! Now you, Douglas! Thomas, we are leaving! Son of a bitch! Move! It hadn't been easy, but Douglas and Skinner had finally forced the sliding door open, covered by members of Thomas's team who laid down their lives so that the remaining survivors could run inside. Thomas was the last one in after Barnes, having seen the rest of his men torn apart as they stood, never giving an inch and firing until the last. The door slammed shut. The screams of the Wendigos could still be heard echoing off the cavern walls. Quick, barricade the door. Whatever you can find. What was that thing? It... it was huge! No idea. Never seen anything like it. Even in the Unstoppables. Douglas, now is not the time for jokes. Who's joking? Diabolicals couldn't have come up with something as horrifying as what's out there. A scream! I thought I was gonna crap myself. There. That should keep the Wendigos out. And I don't think that big one can get under the rock ledge. Is everyone okay? Captain Skinner turned on his flashlight and looked around. 
Emily and Douglas were huddled up together in one corner. Well, they could see just three other researchers from his team in the other corner, passing medkits between them, taking care of various cuts and slashes they received trying to outrun the Wendigos chasing them. Only one of Thomas's team managed to escape the large beast chasing them, Private Barnes. He was double-checking the barricaded door, even as blood ran down his side from a nasty gash he'd received making the last-ditch run for safety. First things first, everyone get patched up and check your ammo. Then we figure out where the hell we are and how the hell to get out of here. Skinner took a moment to check himself. His armor had warded off the worst of what the Wendigos could do, though he was able to get his fingers into several grooves their claws had carved into his torso plate. Thank God for American engineering. Shining his flashlight around the room, Skinner could finally get a sense of where they had found themselves. It certainly didn't look like a mining office. In fact, if he didn't know better, he'd say they were in some kind of control room. The whole space was perhaps 30 feet by 20 feet, with terminals and mainframes lining three of the four walls. The final wall was covered in blank screens, several of them cracked and one hanging off, only held on by a few thick wires. Hmm. Just what in the hell have we gotten ourselves into? Okay, so maybe going down wasn't the best idea. <laughs> Gallows humor, Thomas? Uh, we didn't have a choice. And Douglas was right. Whatever that thing is out there, it needs to be dealt with. And how do you plan on doing that? One miracle at a time, Thomas. Let's check out where we are and see if there's another way out of here. Emily, Douglas, are you both okay? We're alive. I think. Wouldn't be if Emily here hadn't found this place. It was luck, pure and simple. And I don't believe in luck. Whatever it was, we owe you our lives. Now, that doesn't mean our problems are over. We still need to get out of here. So, all of you, check the room for any way out of here and see if you can't get the power to any of these terminals. I don't believe this is part of the original mine, and maybe, just maybe, we can find out more about what happened down here. Barnt and I will watch the door. I can still hear those things crawling around outside, but I think they lost their scent. The survivors slowly rose to their feet and moved with renewed purpose. Douglas went to the rear of the room to check for exits, while Emily and the others examined the terminals. Thanks, Thomas. Keep your ears sharp. If those things get in here before we find a way out, we'll be sitting ducks. The absence of the usual banter left the team working in near silence. Of the original dozen members of Team Cryptid who entered the mine, half of them were dead. Not just dead, but toward the pieces and eaten. For Thomas, it was even worse. As far as he knew, it was only himself and Barnes left, out of the original eight members of Team Sigma. For each and every one of the survivors, they focused on the task at hand, because if they didn't, they could easily become overwhelmed by the hopelessness of their current situation. Skinner could feel it too, which is why he wanted them busy, and maybe find a little hope that they could cling to. Skinner? What is it, Douglas? Good news and bad news. <sighs> All right, give me the good news first. Well, there is an exit back there. And the bad news? It's an exit to nowhere. The tunnel collapsed on the other side. There's no way out of here other than the way we came in. Crap. Skinner. What is it, Emily? Any luck with those terminals? Partially. We were able to get one terminal operational. But it appears to be entirely in Chinese. Chinese? I read Chinese. You do? Seriously? Well, some. Lawson gave me some bootleg Unstoppables comics. They were all in Chinese and very rare. I wanted to be able to read them, so I decided to learn the language. Just like the Silver Shroud. You know he speaks seven languages fluently? I... You know what, Douglas? Just for that, you can keep on quoting the Unstoppables to us. Now, can you get with Emily and see if you can make heads or tails of what's on that terminal? I'll do my best. Well, I appear to have underestimated you, Douglas. It's no big deal. So, show me what you got. Skinner watched as Emily led Douglas over to the now active terminal. He sat down in the old office chair and cracked his knuckles. Here goes nothing. Douglas looked at the screen and started typing furiously at the keyboard. 
He appeared to be inputting some kind of password, and the terminal beeped. We're in. Well, that was easy. They didn't even use basic encryption. Looks almost exactly like our terminals in Vault 76. Same admin passwords, too. How do you know the Vault admin passwords, Douglas? Well, Lawson and I were... Skip the stories, Douglas. What does it say? Give me a minute. Skinner folded his arms and watched Douglas start jotting down notes next to the keyboard as he scrolled through the terminal entries. Wow, this is some diabolicals level stuff here. Spill it, Douglas! Douglas put down his pencil and turned to face Skinner. Well, we were right that this place wasn't part of the original mine. This place was called the Experimental Lab. The phrasing is a little weird. This was the main monitoring station. There are entries from multiple projects, all related to, get this, mutagens. Mutagens? Ugh. I remember something back at the bunker. Some old files the colonel locked down. It was, uh, yeah, mutagenic serum research. The entries are incomplete, but it looks like they were down here working for years. And these last entries... Yeah. This is when it gets really weird. That big thing out there? Well, it's part of something called Project Leviathan. And get this. That used to be Earl Williams. That... that thing used to be human? Ghouls and Wendigos used to be human, too. But this... Golly, the people down here were experimenting on people. Turning them into... monsters? Technical jargon is beyond me, but yeah. The last entry here refers to something called the incident. There was an evacuation order, which I guess is why the place is abandoned. Anything on who these people are? Let me see. Some of the data is corrupt, but... Wait a second. Here's an outgoing entry. A report to... The Pact? The Pact? That's it? It also mentions another lab location. Maybe the main one by how they describe it. Where, exactly? Arctos Pharma. But that place has been abandoned since the war. The Colonel was even there a couple years ago. It's empty. It's not in the building. It's under it. (laughs) Incredible. Are you sure? As sure as I can be. There's a lot more here, but it'll take days to go through it all. Yeah, that's time we don't have. And as interesting as all this is, it won't mean anything to anyone unless we can get out of here. Dulles, is there a layout of the laboratory in there? Let me see. Nope, that's maintenance. No, no, just personal entries here. Oh, wait, here it is. Douglas began typing again, and the screen changed to show a three-dimensional map of the Monongo Mine. There you go. That blinking dot is us. I think. Thomas walked over to the group clustered around the terminal and took a look at the screen. If that's us, then this tunnel was where we came down. That's the cavern we stopped at first. And finally our Wendigo nest. But what's all this down here? Thomas pointed to an area beneath them, one full of additional rooms, and another exit out of the mine. Oh my god, Thomas. You found another way out. Don't break out the champagne just yet. We have a problem. (sighs) What now, Douglas? The only way to access the areas downstairs and get out was through that block tunnel. If I'm reading this right, Douglas, that's not the only way. That way is suicide. Which way, Thomas? There's another access tunnel that leads downstairs. Over here. Like I said, that's not an option. Why? Because we have to go back out into the cavern to get there. We have to go out there? We'll just have to find another way. I can read a map. It's that way or no way at all. How far is it, Thomas? A hundred yards. Maybe 125. And just a few dozen Wendigos and Earl between us and it. Do we even know if that passage is still intact? 
Douglas? Fine, fine. Give me a minute. Why the hell did I need to learn Chinese? As Douglas continued to scroll through the terminal, Skinner was mulling over their options. Thomas was right. If that passage was clear, it was their only way out, and they'd have no choice but to try to make a run for it. It was also the matter of the information they found down here. Little of it made sense at the moment, but the revelation that someone was creating monsters, and it all tied back to Arctos Pharma. The colonel needed to hear about this. Aha! Not even the inspector could do better. What does that even mean? Sorry. Force of habit. <sighs> Just tell us what you found. There's still a couple of active connections to the facility status. Looks like the floors under us suffered some pretty significant damage, but the paths we need still show green. Better yet, that door still works. And it has power. Can we open it from here? We can't. But then again, I don't know if we want to. There's a manual switch next to it. For emergencies. But there's a problem. Uh, Because of course there is! Once we open the door, we won't have a way to close it. Great. Which means the Wendigos will be able to follow us. Not necessarily. I know that look. What are you thinking, Emily? We know the mine is structurally unstable. The creatures can't follow us if we collapse the mine behind us. And I thought I was the only one who read comic books. Is that even possible? Anything is possible, Skinner. My analysis of the seismic data we recorded leads me to believe this whole mine is ready to come apart at the seams. Those earthquakes compromise the structural integrity, if my readings are right. The collapses we experience are just a symptom of a greater problem. That's all well and good. But I don't have enough explosives. Neither does Barnes. Thanks to the old Hornwright Industries, we'll only need a spark to light that fire. How so? While we were all running for our lives, I noticed more than two dozen auto miner charging pods out there. From what I remember of the schematics, each and every one of them contains plenty of fuel, and more importantly, a fusion core. Based on the map Douglas brought up, they are all arrayed against walls. Toss a few grenades in their direction, and it should start a chain reaction. Are you sure you haven't been reading my comic books, Emily? That sounds crazy. Crazy enough that it just might work. Or it might just kill us all. We'll be cutting it close. Those Wendigo will be on top of us almost immediately. Plus, we still need to get through the door. (sighs) Hell, this is crazy. Skinner, you've always said we're Team Cryptid and that we don't quit. Obviously, I can't guarantee this will work. But it's the one chance we have. Trust me, I'd rather there be some other way, but there isn't. Even if we die down here, at least we tried. And better blown up than eaten alive. Skinner looked over the faces of his survivors, and then over to Thomas. It might have been a last throw of the dice, but they'd be damned if they weren't going to give it their all to get their people home. All right, maybe we are all crazy. And yes, we are Team Cryptid. So let's do what we do best. We grab as much information as we can out of here. And anything off that terminal we can manage. Then we get the hell out of this mine. Oh, and blow those monsters to kingdom come. Sounds like a plan. If we survive, I am totally turning this into a comic book. Uh, If we survive, I'm not reading it. And I'll never set foot underground as long as I live. Uh... The bunker is underground. Fine. I'll never set foot in a cave or a mine or a... Oh, shut up. That's the spirit. All right, folks, get to work. Thomas, let's go over the plan. I want to be ready to go within the hour. The survivors of Team Cryptid went to work. Emily, Douglas, and the others combed the room for any records they could find before turning to the terminal to download whatever they could find onto holotapes. Skinner, Thomas, and Barnes walked through what would be necessary to get their people across the cavern to the door. They all knew it wasn't going to be easy, but each of them was willing to die if necessary to ensure that the rest were able to escape. Outside, the Wendigos finished their meals, but they were forever hungry, aching for new flesh to consume. Striding above them, the monster that had once been Earl Williams turns its gaze back into the darkness, waiting for more victims to drop into its grasp. Hi everyone, 
I'm Chris. And I'm not. We're not doing that routine right now. We're trying to do an advertisement. Oh, fine. I'm Sir Aloysius Pernicious, the better half of the team at One Wall Comedy. Okay, I wouldn't go that far. Anyway, come check us out on YouTube. We're your number one source for independent sketch comedy on the internet. Yeah, because that's such a big market. All right, come on. Let's get out of here. I'm getting paid for this, right? Don't push your luck. Team Cryptid gathered near the door of their little sanctuary at the bottom of the Monongah Mine. Douglas winced as he readjusted the straps on his pack, which now included the once active terminal they'd investigated. Unfortunately, there had been no way to get the data off of the machine, so the decision was to take the whole thing with them instead. Remind me never to complain about carrying multi-scope skin. Thomas and Barnes carefully removed the barricades from in front of the sliding metal door, the only obstacle standing between them and a horde of Wendigos and a giant three-headed mutated monster that was once a scavenger named Earl Williams. Captain Skinner stood in front and addressed a small group of survivors. All right, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, people. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and this might be the Hail Mary of all Hail Marys. We've got to cross 300 feet of Wendigo-infested cavern, avoid a giant monster, blow everything to bits on our way out, and then hope and pray that the exit tunnel below us is still intact. Any chance is better than no chance at all. Myself, Barnes, and Skinner are all going to lead the way and try and clear a path. If Earl heads in our direction, we'll try to distract him until y'all get to the door. Speed is key. Don't stop, no matter what happens. Now, thanks to Emily, we know how many grenades we have to toss at those auto minor cradles to start a chain reaction. Each of you has a satchel just in case. The last person through the door has to pull the chain pin and heave the whole thing at the nearest cradle. Then, run like hell. It could bring the whole mine down, just enough to block the Wendigos or anything in between. I don't think the Silver Shroud can come up with a better plan. Does that count as a vote of confidence, Douglas? Maybe. They are definitely not paying me enough for this. We don't get paid, Barnes. Exactly. That's good enough for me. Well, there's no reason to wait any longer. So everyone get ready. And remember, don't stop for anything. Skinner turned and rechecked his rifle, while the others all either did the same or said silent prayers. He didn't expect that they'd all make it, but it was his job to ensure that someone got the word to the White Spring. Whatever they stumbled onto was important, perhaps the most important discovery the team had ever made. You ready? No, but I guess that doesn't matter, does it? Not really. It's been an honor, Skinner. When we get out of here, I owe you a drink at the White Spring. It's a deal. Thomas nodded to Barnes, and they each grabbed one side of the metal doors. It wasn't going to be quiet, so rather than try to go slow, they each pulled as hard as they could. The sound of metal scraping against metal echoed off the walls followed by the screams of the Wendigos. Go, go, go! Don't stop! The cavern exploded in sound as Team Cryptid made a break for it, feet pounding over the dirt floor, splashing through puddles. Skinner, Thomas, and Barnes all opened fire on the glowing creatures, carving a path for the other survivors. Thomas went left while Barnes covered the right, and Skinner ran straight ahead, barely pausing before sliding another magazine into his rifle and firing again as the Wendigos began to converge upon them. The howling scream of Earl could be heard above everything, and Skinner caught sight of the huge monster as it stepped out from behind one of the giant rock pillars, holding up the roof of the cavern. Douglas and Emily ran together, each pulling the other forward, even as they stumbled and tried to keep moving as they were assaulted by the sounds of gunfire and screeching creatures. There was a high-pitched scream behind them as one of the other survivors was jumped by a large wendigo. The creature slashed with its long claws, disemboweling the researcher with a single swipe before tearing into their guts with its teeth. Thomas cursed under his breath and slowed down, firing at a group of creatures trying to circle around behind them. The heavy stomps of Earl were getting louder, and they all could feel the hairs beginning to stand up on the backs of their neck as the creatures' screams rebounded off the cavern walls. Skinner, get to the door! Burns and I will distract Earl! 
Skinner acknowledged with a nod and kept firing, even as he saw more Wendigos crawling out of the walls. In the barely illuminated cavern, Skinner could see the alcove containing the door, their way out. It may have only been 50 yards away, but it felt like a mile. Emily, look out! Another Wendigo leapt out of the darkness and knocked Emily from her feet. It pounced on her prone body, preparing to claw her open. Oh, no you don't. Douglas grabbed the first thing he gave his hands on, which just happened to be the bulky terminal strapped to his back. Swinging it like a bat, he smashed the computer against the side of the Wendigo's head, cracking its skull like an egg, splattering both he and Emily with gore and glowing blood. Get up, we gotta go. Emily shoved the dead body away and got to her feet, holding onto Douglas's hand for dear life as they ran towards the waiting door. There was yet another scream, and another as the last following researchers were set upon by more Wendigos while Thomas and Barnes found themselves face to face with Earl. The monster, still half hidden in the shadow and illuminated by the flashes of rifle fire, reared up and screamed again, forcing Barnes to his knees as he fought against the panic caused by the creature's howl. Thomas kept firing, aiming for one of the three large heads, then having to roll away as Earl smashed down on one of his enormous feet, raising a cloud of dust from the floor. Spitting acid now out of its three mouths, Earl tried to squash Thomas and Barnes like the bugs they were, stomping with its feet over and over, even as its smallish arms clawed against the darkness. Almost simultaneously, Douglas, Emily, and Skinner reached the alcove, hiding the exit door. Get it open, now! Douglas, in a near panic, couldn't find the switch. He looked to the left and right, but his eyes were sticky with glowing blood. Emily shouldered her way in beside him and found the handle. She pulled it with all of her might and was rewarded when the wall appeared to part in front of them, revealing a long concrete hallway illuminated with red emergency lighting. Skinner didn't hesitate and pushed both Emily and Douglas through the door. Just keep going! Turning back, Skinner raised his rifle again and fired into the mass of Wendigos. He could still hear the sounds of gunfire, which meant at least someone was still alive, but they were out of time. Thomas! Time to go! It was barely audible above the din of battle and the screams of the Wendigos, but both Thomas and Barnes heard Skinner. Exchanging quick glances, Barnes pulled the explosive satchel off his back. There wasn't time to communicate what he was about to do, but Thomas saw it in Barnes' eyes. Firing off the last magazine before throwing the rifle at Earl's face, watching it bounce harmlessly off, Thomas grabbed his own explosive satchel and nodded to Barnes. Together, they flung their explosive towards the opposite sides of the cavern before turning around and running as fast as they could. The fuses were set for 10 seconds, which felt like an eternity. Barnes did his best to fire from the hip as they ran, scattering the Wendigos in front of them, even as Skinner tried to cover them from the alcove. As the seconds counted down, Earl screamed again and lowered itself, charging towards the human intended to kill and feed to its minions. Thomas and Barnes could feel the monster behind them, getting closer and closer. Not all of the Automonor cradles were fueled, there were more than enough to cause a massive chain reaction of explosions, tearing through the cavern, vaporizing dozens of Wendigos. The shockwave was enough to lift both Thomas and Barnes off their feet, and fling them the last two dozen or so feet directly into Skinner, end over end into the hallway, even as the whole cavern started to come apart under the force of the detonation. Boulders the size of houses crashed to the floor, destroying the leftover mining equipment and smashing Wendigos into paste. The three operatives got hastily to their feet and continued to run down the hallway, their boots echoing against the concrete. One Wendigo jumped after them, almost clearing the door, when it too was crushed by a giant rock from the ceiling. The monster known as Earl, Project Leviathan, screamed again and again, even as one of its heads was caved in by a falling rock, until the entire ceiling gave way, sending thousands of tons of rocks down into the cavern, ending Earl's screams once and for all.
The five survivors of Team Cryptid slowly made their way through the dust-filled hallway, even as the mine continued to settle above them. The ceilings had grown under the weight of the collapsed rock, but they had also held. They finally reached another metal door, which opened at the press of a button, revealing an empty laboratory space. So this is where they made their monsters? It would appear so. Looks like they left in quite the hurry. The files did say something about an incident. Incident? Take a look at this. Looks like their experiments might have gotten loose. Sir, with all due respect, I think that's an understatement. Thomas was standing over a large brownish stain on the floor next to the rotted corpse of a wendigo. It appeared to have gotten out of its cell, a dozen or so feet away, with the door wide open, and it attacked someone, leaving a pool of coagulated blood. Killed by their own creations. <laughs> a little poetic if you ask me. <sighs> All right, let's get the hell out of here. I've had enough of this mine to last a lifetime. I think we all agree the passage out of here should be over past those desks. Douglas, where is the terminal? What terminal? The one you were carrying. Oh, that. Remember when I brained the one that was on you? You didn't. I did. Sorry. If I had to choose between those files and my people, I'd take my people any day of the week. You did the right thing, Douglas. We still have some of the information we collected, and that's good enough for me. Emily just smiled and walked over to Douglas, giving him a hug and a kiss on the cheek. Thank you, Douglas. And I promise not to make fun of the Unstoppables ever again. Aw, shucks. It was impossible for Douglas to hide his blushing face, and it got a laugh out of everyone else. The group then made their way towards the rear door, finding it unblocked and easily opened with a pry bar, revealing yet another long hallway that sloped up this time. Did you hear that? I do. We aren't alone. Could we please just catch a break? Just once? Skinner took out his pistol, knowing none of them had much in the way of ammunition left, and they certainly weren't in any condition for a serious fight. The echoes of gunfire continued as they crept down the hallway, but finally tapered off to silence as the survivors caught a glimpse of sunlight up ahead. Can you feel that breeze? Sure can. Quiet down, you two! Creeping forward, Skinner discovered the hallway merged into a natural cave, with the entrance a few dozen feet in front of him. Sunlight filtered through a pile of rubble, and Skinner's chest tightened, but when he approached it, he found that it was made up of small rocks which were easily moved aside. Thomas! Barnes! Get up here and help! The three of them worked quickly, opening up the entrance and stepping out into the fresh air of an Appalachian late afternoon, raising their hands to their eyes against the glare of the sun. Each of them breathed a sigh of relief. Against all odds, they had escaped. Douglas and Emily followed, hand in hand, smiling at their first glimpse of the sky in what felt like forever. That's when Barnes saw it. Super mutants! Well, Thomas and Skinner pulled out their weapons and pointed, only to discover, when their eyes had finally adjusted to the light, that they were standing above a small valley, with dead super mutants and mutant hounds scattered along the valley floor. What happened here? It looks like an ambush. But who did the ambushing? Skinner didn't need to wait for an answer. Several figures wearing power armor and carrying miniguns rose from the lip of the valley opposite the group. Those guns were now pointed directly at them. We are the Brotherhood of Steel. Put down your guns and surrender immediately. This is your only warning. Well, shit. Do what they say. I thought the Brotherhood of Steel died a long time ago. Maybe they're just the new Brotherhood. Who knows? I think people with miniguns can just call themselves whatever they want. Thomas Skinner and Barnes put their guns on the ground, and everyone else held up their hands. The members of the Brotherhood marched forward, past the dead super mutants, and up to where Team Cryptid was standing. Skinner recognized the armor from his time in the U.S. Army before the war. They were wearing T-51B, slightly modified by the looks of it. He found himself confronted by the leader, this Knight Shin. Identify yourself! Captain Skinner, Team Cryptid, New Enclave. And just who the hell are you? New Enclave? You're from the White Spring. And what of it? 
and you have no right to hold me and my people. We've been through hell, and we have important business to get to. You're not going back to the White Spring, Lawrence. Skinner did a double take. Two more people, not wearing power armor, were walking up the hillside towards them, and he recognized that voice. Overseer! I'd say it was good to see you again, Lawrence, but seeing you wearing that uniform turns my stomach. Now you see here, Overseer. You too, Henry, and the rest of you. I am so disappointed. You turned your back on our family. You turned your back on Appalachia, where we're going to set things right. But first, you are coming back with us. My friends here have a lot of questions about what has been going on around here and what your new enclave is responsible for. Overseer, you don't understand. We found things. There's something very terrible going on here. That's enough! We've heard all about what you've done. You will have the opportunity to explain yourselves back at Fort Atlas. Until then are prisoners of the Brotherhood of Steel. Skinner and Thomas tried to protest, but to no avail. The group of survivors were led off back up the trail to the southeast, towards the old Atlas Observatory. Day, who had been silent during the confrontation and disgusted by the way they were treating these people, for no good reason that he could see, followed behind the Overseer. Overseer? What is it, my boy? Is this necessary? Taking them prisoner? They weren't doing anything. We don't have a choice, Day. Appalachia is coming apart at the seams, and Valeria is responsible. I know it. Lawrence is a good man. I know I can convince him to tell the truth. The others, well, we'll see. What do you mean, we'll see? We are at war, Day, and I'm prepared to do whatever it takes. One way or the other, they'll tell us what we need to know. Day stopped in his tracks. He'd never heard the Overseer talk like this before. There was something in the tone that scared him even more than what she had said. He needed to find a way to stop this, to change her mind, or convince her there was another way. But he felt like events were spinning out of his control. Is this the future you wanted to build? Day took another look over his shoulder at the mountain the prisoners had emerged from. He needed to talk to them, in private, and find out what was really going on, before it was too late. And that's it. Site W is completely gone. Damn, damn, damn! What happened? Sensors detected a series of explosions, confirmed by our remaining infrared cameras. The entire facility collapsed. And Leviathan? Gone as well. We have to assume all subjects were terminated. Ah, uh, this will set us back years! Just when we were about to present our findings to the Council! This is a disaster. Sorry, Doctor. Get out! Just get out of my sight! Wait a moment, wait. Perhaps not all is lost. We may need to accelerate our other plans. Open a channel to Blue Ridge Caravan. I would like to speak to Mr. Costas. And Site W? And the Council? For once, playing second fiddles of Blackburn has its usefulness. No one will be asking too many questions as long as they're focused on Keystone and Project Oni. This stays between us, do you understand? Otherwise, I will be rapidly in need of new test subjects. I understand fully, Doctor. Stand by for your connection to the Blue Ridge. Good. Good. We need to get our hands on A742B as soon as possible. She will be the key to getting us back on track and will more than make up for the failures of Leviathan. I have Mr. Costas, Dr. Cardoza. Ah, Mr. Costas. I very much need to speak to you regarding antlers. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Fire Rider, and I'm the host of The Pixel People, a podcast dedicated to taking a close look at our favorite characters from our favorite video games. From major characters who define the course of a game's storyline, to smaller characters who you might have never noticed. Every week, we go beyond the quest line to examine a particular character's story arc and choices, and discover the real-world parallels and life lessons hidden just below the surface. I hope you'll join us. You can find the Pixel People on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. Thank you again, members, for joining us here on The Modus Files. If you've enjoyed this content, please subscribe. And better yet, please leave a review to help others find our little enclave. You can also follow us on our various social media accounts, including Twitter, Instagram, and Blue Sky, at Modus Files, or at Modus Files Podcast, for more information about our story, Fallout 76 content, and random musings on the Enclave. I'd also like to thank our cast, Chris Smith from One Wall Comedy as Earl Williams, Private Phillips, Private Barnes, and Knight Shin. Chrissy Williams as Researcher Emily, Jessica Starr as Scavenger Number 1, Ryan Negrin as Day, Wendy Novoselsky as The Overseer, Josh Smith as Captain Skinner, DJ Reed as Captain Thomas in Gray 5, Phobos as Dr. Jeffrey Cardoza, Eric Gold as Douglas, Ray O'Hare as Gray 34 in Scavenger Number 2, Rissa Montanez as Technician Number 1, Amanda Lee as Technician Number 2, and Brad Williams as the voice of Modus. As our third season continues, we'd like to give a huge shout out to our fellow Fallout creators and also announce that we have created a Patreon to give our supporters easy access to episodes, original scripts, and special events with our cast. You can find the Patreon link in our podcast description and at our website, modusfiles.com. A very special thank you to Nobody, our first commissioned artist who is working on updated portraits of our main cast. Stay tuned for our next episode, Hunter Hunted. Lastly, thank you to all of our subscribers and supporters. God bless the Enclave, and God bless America. Members, we look forward to your next visit to our little Enclave. <laughs>